Good morning, good good evening, everyone. I should say, uh, wherever you guys are, welcome to another series of educational series of International Dermatology Education Foundation. I am Leon Kursik. I am a clinical professor of dermatology at Von Sinai Medical Center in New York City, as well as the president of International Dermatology Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that puts those educational series on. Our guest tonight is Dr. Zaki Tahir. He's a board certified dermatologist at the Department of Medicine, also at the University of Alberta. He's an assistant clinical professor and he is the founder of Lucier Dermatology and Laser Clinics. Tonight's subject is the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. This is a very close subject to my heart, and I always call vehicles do matter. So our supporter tonight is Johnson & Johnson, and we thank you very much for us to be enabled, to make us enabled uh, to put this program together. However, a couple of housekeeping stuff before we begin. Please, if you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial information will be displayed. At the end of this webinar, there's a survey will pop up in your browser and will be mailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out this very short survey so that we can better our programs. If you're having a technical issue, or if you'd like, you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Within one, two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be mailed to you. So again, if you have any questions, please do write it on the pane on the right side of your screen. And what we'll do is at the end of the program, when Dr. Tai finishes his lecture, we'll go over those questions as time permitted. Before we go on, I'd like to give you a little bit of our perspective of what's going on in the dermatology education world. Uh, and you know, before the pandemic, what we had normal is live programs and what I call the, um, the steak uh, and chicken meals that we enjoyed in the restaurants are sort of over. And now we are in the webinar world and this is why we are doing the webinars but hopefully once the pandemic is over uh, we will still enjoy the live programs but I think still the webinars are here to stay and it's sort of convenient and so um, to introduce you my nonprofit organization called International Dermatology Education Foundation IDEF is a nonprofit and our principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatologic care all over the world through education, especially in underserved areas. We have performed so many educational activities, not only in US, but as well as in Canada, as well as globally. And we have worked almost every pharmaceutical companies involved in dermatology. So tonight, again, one more time, our guest is Dr. Zeki Tahir, who is a board certified dermatologist and assistant clinical professor at Department of Medicine at University of Alberta and the founder of Lucier Dermatology and Laser Clinics. And he's gonna tell us all about the dynamic skin barrier and why formulation matters. Welcome and thank you. Take it over, Zaki. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Kursik. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Kursik is a very prominent, well-known and respected dermatologist, as you all know and he's certainly a mentor uh, for, for folks like me. So thank you very much for all of you um, joining us today. Uh, these are my disclosures to share. And like Dr. Kursik had mentioned, uh, this is something that's a near and dear topic to all of our hearts. Uh, we absolutely know the value of the skin barrier and hopefully by sharing some information about how to evaluate it and understand the structure itself, we can help with understanding the role of the skin barrier. Now, if I was, I'll just go back one slide there. Uh, we'll go ahead and analyze the research that's been done. I want to focus on that and actually point out that the products that we're discussing, those by Johnson & Johnson, they have done a phenomenal and incredible job with their special research setup in New Jersey, where you have hundreds of people uh, working and PhDs and experts um, sending uh, all spending all their time, their research, their brain power 
to create better and better products. So uh, thank you to all of them. Um, so everyone, let's get started. So I'm really excited. We're going to talk about products, ingredients, research, and hopefully understand the skin barrier a little bit better. So I'm going to start and stop at this first polling question. What factors do you consider when making ingredients or product recommendations to your patients? Please select one of the following. I only look for specific ingredients in a product. The formulation of the entire product matters. I reference the clinical research. I have samples available to provide my patients or all of the above. So I'll let you guys go ahead and share your thoughts on this one. And I love the all of the above because I think that's certainly on our mind. I think it's very pragmatic to say samples matter as well. Um, I'm glad that some people focus on formulation because of course, we're always looking out for ingredients and making sure that it's compatible with what our patients need and what they will tolerate. And of course, ingredients, ingredients, ingredients. We want to make sure we're delivering optimal ingredients for our patients. So we'll move on to our next slide. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the conventional examples or the conventional model that we refer to. We are so used to brick and mortar. Because brick and mortar is easy, and there's nothing wrong with easy, of course, but sometimes easy means we're not using enough brain cells. Uh, it doesn't give us the full understanding of everything involved with the skin and, and all of its beautiful functions. And I think this is like a symphony. And when we think about it, we have that outer layer of skin where you have renewal and repair. We have next in this symphony, you have someone on the snare drums who's working on anti an antimicrobial barrier, you have immune response barrier, and then of course you have permeability and moisture barrier, which we need to be intact when we're handling how we hold on to moisture. And then of course there's photoprotection and antioxidant barrier. Our job as clinicians who make recommendations and care for skin is to understand the role of all of these factors in taking care of our patient's skin. We know that these are all interconnected and these are co-regulated functions and a mastery of this helps us get a better result and makes us more confident. And I think that confidence is key. We have to change how we think and have that confidence in recommending the best products for our patients. It's scary. The scariest thing that I've done, I've done two scary things in the last 12 months. One of them, I started taking swimming lessons because me as an old man, I don't know how to swim and it's embarrassing and I need to learn how to swim. And that's hard and it's scary. But there's one thing scarier than being afraid of water. It's taking my, my daughter, she's now 13. I took her to the drugstore aisle for skincare, for acne. And here I am, a dermatologist, I started my residency training 16 years ago. I've been in solo practice of my own for the last nine years, and I have never felt so scared. And it's weird because when we think about our patients who don't have our background or experience, they're far more scared than I possibly could have been, but I was scared to death. And that's because there's so much choice. It's hard to know what the best choices are. So knowing that there are products that focus on the different aspects of the a permeability barrier. So we're gonna talk about moisturizers, the antimicrobial and immune response barrier, the antioxidant barrier and photoprotection. We know we have a comprehensive approach that comes from having a respect of all of the aspects of the skin itself and how the barrier works. So now, what are things that can go wrong? How can we mess up the actual function of the permeability or moisture barrier of skin. So you will have patients with conditions or skin concerns where they have desquamation abnormalities. And those can be inherent endogenous problems with genetic function and how their skin actually desquamates. You can have a disruption of water retaining capability and that's called natural moisturizing factors, NMF. 
you can have an increase in skin pH, skin surface pH, and you could have a deficiency in intercellular lipids. So the optimization of barrier function using products that we apply to skin has to take into account all of these factors. Now, let's talk about more factors. And then after this, I'll talk about more factors. We have age, we have genetics, we have ethnicity. There are so many external factors, things that we apply to the skin. Different body regions are different and have to be respected and treated differently. And then you have to take into account the patient's skin care. It may be a nuisance for us in dermatology, but it's a necessity. We need to know what's in that bag. And sometimes we'll roll our eyes when we see a patient with a bigger bag, but the number of times that's bailed me out of a tough clinical scenario where we're like, ah, okay, that product has that ingredient and that's the reason you have that problem. And that's again, respecting the fact that everything matters. Climate, I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It is dry and it's cold and I don't think humans were meant to live here, but here I am and I love this city but geez, my skin doesn't. So we know climate is a really important factor. Sun damage, of course, no matter where you live on earth. I live somewhere dry and cold, but guess what? Sun is very important. Those who are in Texas or Florida or California, well, you guys are gonna have <clears throat> a lot of sun damage to deal with. And then there's actually variations within the days themselves. Now, have we ever really thought about the intraday variations? Did you know transepidermal water loss, or TOOL, peaks while you sleep? Did you know your alkaline soap products can increase the skin surface pH, which we already said may not be a good thing, and impair the barrier? Of course, we know DNA repair defenses fluctuate during the day. When you take a thorough history of your patients, have you ever noticed or have you ever asked, when do you feel most oily? When do you need to get that blotting paper out? Well, sebum production peaks at midday. And of course we know hormones are so critical at affecting how our skin behaves and changes in cortisol levels can have negative effects in skin. So that's why when you see people who are really stressed, you see them looking sullen, haggard, down, all dull. All the words that our patients come in with, they're real and patients are more stressed than ever before, so all of this really matters. Now, skin care solutions designed for that dynamic skin barrier, and we are going to talk about four major issues, cleansing, treating, moisturizing, and of course, protecting the skin. So let's talk about gentle cleansing approaches, and I like the word gentle. Now, the impact of cleansing on the skin barrier is huge. Of all the things that people may do or not do, we know that in general, men do the least for their skin. But one thing that men and women, people who love skin or don't love skin or into skin care or aren't into skin care, they at least try to most, on, for the most part, I hope, keep their skin clean. Now, the problem is some cleansers can actually be very bad for that barrier. Some can change the pH and increase that pH. Some can create such a dysfunction of the skin that you'll increase transepidermal water loss, create a greater protease activity, and you increase desquamation. And of course, the functional outcome of all of that is inflammation, one of the key factors that create oxidative stress and result from permeability barrier impairment. So what do we do? Well, let's look at the history of everything we've used as humans over a long period of time. It's nice to be on the more recent side of the historical timetable. Look what they used before. Do-it-yourself soaps, glycerin soaps, Sindet bars. Here we have these exceptional products that are now available to us. So there's been a lot of progress that's been made and that progress is mainly sur surrounds and respects the fact that we have to respect the skin barrier. What happens when you don't use good cleansing? Surfactant-based cleansers can interact with skin and have some negative outcomes. They can impair the barrier and cause redness. You can increase or induce inflammation that will make you dry and itchy. You can have oxidative stress that burdens the skin. That's where patients feel uncomfortable. And of course, you'll actually have sensory, sensorial irritation 
to the skin when your cell signaling is disrupted. So there's a lot that can go wrong just with that simple step of cleansing wrong. Now what's cool about products that have developed over time? We have something called hydrophobically modified polymers, HMP. And the idea is you take a surfactant that tends to make up the ordinary cleanser and you kind of wrap it up. You use this HMB to wrap up all of these surfactants to minimize the surfactant penetration into the skin, reduce transepidermal water loss, but create an effective cleansing experience for the consumer. And that, my friends, is why we love, and in my practice, why we love options like the Johnson & Johnson cleanser. Patients who experience it, now look at what this study looked at. They looked at the most important, I think, group of patients that I deal with in my cosmetic practice, that's 25 to 54 year old women, and that's an ideal target population to talk about what does it take to make you feel like your skin is clean? And that's the beauty of this study that was done where we actually look at the cleanser. Does it leave any residue? You have a winner with an HMP technology. Does it feel like you're actually clean? Does it feel like you're actually smooth and soft? And do you actually feel like you don't overly dry skin? The cleanser with the HMP technology was the winner. The above, the most important question, of course, is does my feel, but does my skin feel completely clean? And you see that with HMP technology. This is the Neutrogena Ultra Gentle Daily Cleanser. Now, my practice is interesting. I was discussing with Dr. Kersig before I started. I have a practice that's 50 50. Half my day I'm in medical, half my day I'm in cosmetic dermatology. In my cosmetic practice, this product is at every single bedside. <clears throat> and you could imagine the value and importance of cleansing skin. That applies to any laser procedure because we don't need gunk and dirt. We don't need anything disrupting the chromophores that we're actually targeting with my lasers. I need to have very clean skin because I cannot afford to have a speck of makeup in the field of my filler procedures. In the end, some of these fillers are essentially dermal implants. Cleansing really matters. Now, in 14 clinical studies, looking at over 800 subjects, the HMP cleanser was used as a companion product in combination with other therapies or as just the primary test product on different skin types. And what was the conclusion is you thoroughly remove dirt, oil, and makeup. And patients feel soft, smooth and clean without being overly dried. Very, very nice outcome. Let's talk about the role of emollients to restoring the skin barrier. Again, I'm in a dry and cold place. Atopic dermatitis, eczema, or in the US, eczema is a big, big deal. And we know moisturization is one of the most important things that we can work with. That's something we can modify and change patients' lives. So what is the role of an emollient? Well, first let's talk about the different categories of products that we can use to attract and seal water. On the one hand, you have occlusives. So this is something that provides a layer of oil, sits on the surface of the skin, and it slows water loss, thereby increasing moisture content of the stratum corneum. Then we have humectants. These are substances that are introduced into the stratum corneum to increase water holding capacity. That's something that sits on the surface in order to get into and break into, uh, break into the house, if we can call it. Now, the idea is optimizing your moisture that you're delivering to the patient's skin. You want to allow that skin to rehydrate. You want to create a diffusion gradient where water can kind of exert, exert its influence at all layers of skin. This was an interesting study where they looked at topically applied ceramides and where it actually goes when deployed on skin. And this was a bit of an eye opener. So on the left hand side, the study looked at with staining and imaging, what happened to ceramides that were applied to the surface of the skin. The final conclusion was many times with leading ceramide products, you're actually creating 
little pools of ceramides that are stuck in the glyphs, the dermatoglyphs of skin, without much penetration into the skin. And in fact, small fatty acids were probably your better choice to try to get some deeper effects. So what can we do to make things better? Dr. Kursik touched on this. Vehicle matters. We have to make sure that whatever condition we're treating, the vehicles we choose make all the difference between a good result and a great result. What's interesting about the gel, uh, sorry, the unique liquid crystal gel matrix technology is when you have the right ingredients, you have the ability, it's almost like if I was to carry on with my analogy of breaking into the house, it allows you to have better penetration and get into that house. So here we have hyaluronic acid. As we know, hyaluronic acid is so popular, so beneficial, because it binds to water and holds it within the skin surface. Then you have glycerin. We know glycerin is actually quite effective in skin, and it can really get into that layer, the ninth layer of skin, for a deep, long-lasting hydration. And of course, remember that lab that I mentioned where you have a lot of really smart people working on products? Well, finding from a product that's very popular, we all know about JLo and her olive oil. Well, olive oil actually does have some useful ingredients, maybe not the whole olive oil itself, but you have an ingredient that can form liquid crystals within the formulation that are similar to the skin surface lipid barrier organization. So you're mimicking what's happening in the skin barrier and that like begets like allows that deep lasting hydration to penetrate deep down into skin. So it truly is like someone opening the door, allowing that water to march through and coat and create that moisturization effect deeper down. Now let's measure. What happens when we actually measure what happens? So this is a skin conduction measurement looking at moisturization over time in treated, so that's the gel matrix moisturizer in the blue, or untreated skin. And you see over a fairly long period of time, right up to 48 hours, you have an increase in kinetic skin conductance. So we know we're having a prolonged moisturization efficacy because of the gel matrix moisturizer. Now let's look at untreated skin, skin that's, been ha that's had a disruption to the barrier itself, and what happens to the transepithelial electrical resistance when you have a treated skin that's had a disrupted barrier with that gel matrix moisturizer? Well, you get a much, much higher TER measurement in the skin that's treated with the gel matrix moisturizer also very useful data. <clears throat> this is one of my favorites and I'll guide you through this. So on the bottom right hand side, you see something with a lot of different bright colors. Red is desirable. Red is higher water content and blue and purple is lesser water content. So you have a Roy G. Biv rainbow, um, rainbow spectroscopy basically. <clears throat> so when you look at the relative water content in epidermis, in untreated skin, you don't see a lot of red specks. On the other hand, the gel matrix moisturization, moisturizer treated skin has significant red. So there's an 86% increase in relative water content in the stratum corneum versus the untreated control, and you have an overall 33% better hydration than skin treated with the leading gel matrix moisturizer. Very, very nice results. Very, very intriguing. Now let's look at endogenous lipids. And this was a really surprising results to me because to me, I would expect that having ceramides as the primary ingredient to get into skin, that ceramide activity might actually induce more ceramide activity. Well, this study actually compared gel matrix moisturizer, that's the blue, with the benchmark ceramide containing moisturizer, that's the yellow. On the very bottom left, those first two um, bars are examining ceramide synthesis genes. And strangely, but very, very intriguing, the gel matrix moisturizer resulted in significantly higher gene induction of ceramide synthesis. When we look at keratinocyte differentiation genes, 
the same outcome where the gel matrix moisturizer with statistical significance had a much higher induction of keratinocyte differentiation genes than the ceramide containing moisturizer. Now, if we look at our bottom right, we're looking at the increase in ceramide generation over time. And we can see at baseline T0, where we're looking at the gel matrix, comparing it to that benchmark ceramide containing moisturizer, at four weeks, you have a much higher uh, concentration of ceramide than with the benchmark ceramide product. Very surprising, this was uh, presented at the World Congress of Dermatology. Again, surprising results, but maybe not so surprising for those of us who actually use the product. And that's the Neutrogena Hydroboost Gel Cream. Now, this is cool. This is a truth. That balance between aesthetics and therapeutic, where patients want that soft, beautiful, glowing skin, that aesthetic finesse of a product, and then they want that therapeutic benefit. Well, here we have a long, dry, cold winter, and there are a few products that can perform as well as the Neutrogena Hydro Boost does. Retinols. Retinols, retinols. We almost think of them as the promised land when it comes to the aesthetic side of our lives. Uh, I did my fellowship at the University of Ottawa. That was almost 11 years ago, 11 or 12 years ago. And I remember a simple rule, unless someone had raging rosacea, anyone walking out of an aesthetic practice should have some form of retinol. Now, retinol is very in vogue. <clears throat> and the more popular something becomes, uh, I almost demand that anyone who I teach as a resident or anyone who I lecture, you need to know it inside out because patients become so smart and sophisticated. So we know retinol is a very sophisticated molecule. There are uh, many ways to get it uh, through diet, where we're talking about vitamin A specifically, all trans retinol. And we also know it has a long and rich history, both in its discovery, it was discovered just over 100 years ago. So it's not that old, just kidding, it's been around forever, but it was just discovered 100 years ago. And over time, it was synthesized in the laboratory in 1947. Dermatologists got interested in it, and then dermatologists got lost interest in it completely. And then suddenly in the 90s, the skincare industry, as is uh, with many innovations in skin and dermatology, realized that there could be some use and application of retinols if we could find how to make this a more stable product that's more elegant to use. 1996, Neutrogena was first to launch a stabilized retinol product. Daily in a dermatology practice, the uses of retinol are fairly, fairly, fairly extensive. Um, I'll name my favorites on this list. We love it for photo aging. We know we use it every day, multiple times a day in acne. Uh, we know it can be very useful in pigmentary disorders. Uh, we know it can be very useful in hyperkeratotic disorders. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, the actual pathway of a retinol actually matters a lot. Now, the reason I memorize this is so I can have a good, strong, uh, knowledgeable conversations with my very, very smart, sophisticated patients. Your patients probably know this as well as we do, if not better. And they've probably tried products, uh, consumer products or prescription products that have one element of retinol somewhere along this pathway. And they're definitely going and learning about retinols from people who are not as trained or as big an expert as you are. So we know we start off with our retinal esters. You have esterases that get it to a retinol, which become retinaldehyde, which become retinoic acid. All of the magic happens with that intracellular retinoic acid where it can modify all of these genes. And we try to make use of this very versatile, dynamic, an effective molecule because that modification of all those genes must have some clinical effect that we can use to our advantage and to help our patients. Now, what do we do about our knowledge? Why do we have that knowledge? Well, that knowledge allows us to decide where we want to play when it comes to our patients and the products we tell them to either buy or prescribe them to get from the pharmacy. <clears throat> we can start with retinol esters. Retinol esters 
uh, which are highly stable, very low irritant, and very, very low potency. We can work our way up to retinoic acid, and even within the retinoic acids, we play within this family to both in potency and irritation to have a clinical effect. And then there's usually the consumer products that play somewhere in between. Now, what does a retinol do in the skin? We know it has so many very, very important functions. The in vogue term right now is collagen induction. We know that increased TGF beta has a number of benefits in wound healing and skin renewal. It increases elastin, glycosaminoglycans, and collagen. Uh, we know that the role of retinols in keratinocyte proliferation and normalizing skin cell time turnover is very critical in how it helps the skin and skin health. We know that heparin binding epidermal growth factor, like uh, HBGF, can result in better dermal repair and dermal cell proliferation. And we have a reduction in matrix metalloproteinases when we use our retinols. Now, what do these words really mean? Where does it really, really benefit us? Hyaluronic acid is one of the things we want to induce. So we've already talked about the role of hyaluronic acid, how it attracts water and it, how it supports the skin. And we know the retinols, uh, when studied in the uh, product line that uh, we have at hand, uh, can create an increase in um, hyaluronic acid versus vehicle. We also know that glycosaminoglycans, a very important uh, component of uh, the structure of skin, uh, the sugars of the skin, and something that we would love to always constantly induce to give people both volume and glow. Uh, we know that retinols over a long period of time, if you look at that on the bottom left, by week 24, you can actually have a much higher induction of glycosaminoglycans with retinol-treated skin. Now, what else can retinols do when it comes to cell proliferation? We can measure fibroblast outgrowth, epidermal skin thickness, and KI-67 staining, and we find that retinols can actually be superior versus control in every single parameter that we actually find valuable when it comes to cell proliferation. Now, how does a retinol work to actually protect skin itself? Well, one of its best uses, if you look on the bottom right there, on the right-hand side, is it reduces collagen degradation. And it does that with matrix metalloprotein proteinase reduction. Versus a control, you'll actually find that retinol will have that benefit. Another useful dermal support structure is tropoelastin. And when we stain for that and we compare retinol versus control in the middle, you'll actually find that there's an increase in tropoelastin in retinol-treated skin. And then we'll start with the very left, or we'll end with the very left, and we'll talk about collagen induction and look over a period of time, what does retinol do with collagen? And you find by about month six or 24 weeks, you have an induction of collagen and an increase in collagen expression. So what does it take to make a recommendation to your patient? For us, we make recommendations based on effectiveness and the quality of the product that the patient is given. We want something that is bioactive, we want something that has a good innovative formula, and we always want something that has a clinical effect that's desirable for our patient's needs. I love the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle Repair line. On the one hand, as a cosmetic dermatologist, I have many options when it comes to superb uh, physician-grade skincare lines that we may have, but many times patients just want to say, what is it at the drugstore that I should get first? There is no question. My favorite option is the Neutrogena Rapid Wrinkle, Wrinkle Repair line. And I like it, again, this was something that I was recommended uh, recommending to my patients even before knowing much with, uh, of the science. Uh, one of the reasons I'm really delighted to share all of this information today is, number one, there's actually a significant amount of science. Um, as doctors, as, uh, as, as people making recommendations to patients, we take on a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of burden on us to make the best recommendations we can. And 
it gets confusing. Remember, I told you it's confusing to be a consumer. When I was at that aisle, I had no idea what to do. And our job is just to be a bit of a guide to our patients. The one aspect that we always hold on to, and especially as dermatologists, we hold near and dear is clinical trials, uh, efficacy in studies to show that our recommendations can hold some water. So this is a good example. When we look at Crab B2 expression, uh, you see that over a period of time, the cellular retinoic acid binding protein 2, um, the change versus untreated skin is significantly higher with the Rapid Wrinkle Repair Night product line versus some of the other prestige lines, as well as some of the um, uh, products that are available in uh, in the consumer aisles uh, that your patients would otherwise not know what to use. So it's very useful to know that you have something that has the backing of science. Now, when we look at the actual activity of the retinol, uh, an innovative step, and again, this is cool because we're looking at science and we're looking at nature. We're looking at a way that nature can supplement and enhance the science of our products. You have a very interesting plant. This is called a myrtus flower, a Mediterranean shrub. My wife is uh, from Tunisia originally, her family, and this is something that I'm completely familiar with uh, in the Mediterranean. And I didn't know it was such a useful product, but here you have another discussion about nature enhancing a result. So if you look at the curve on the bottom right, you look at the Crab B2 mRNA production, and you see that the non-treated control, there's a very low level of that Crab B2 mRNA. I've already shown you how retinol compared to its competitors uh, has a superior effect on that Crab B2 mRNA level in cells. But what's interesting is this special plant, the Myrtus flower, actually enhances that activity. It boosts the bioactivity of the retinol, which is a really cool thing. So that's the second time in this talk. On the one hand, we talked about olive oil, and here we're talking about um, this Myrtus flower. Very nice to see uh, how nature can help us. As a clinician who prescribes retinol, the biggest challenge that we face is how patients respond or how they actually take to the retinols. On the one hand, they can be extremely irritated. And that's one of the most frustrating phone calls to get. Because anytime we get a phone call for a cream adverse reaction, it's like, ugh, how could this have been avoided? And it's just a cream. How did this cream cause this patient to be so mad at me? Well, the fact is, if anyone has ever used a retinol or started using a retinol out of nowhere, out of the blue, this can be a very complex topic, right? Retinols are not always easy to start using. Retinols can actually be quite challenging. I remember, and again, it was during my fellowship where, you know, geez, I'm talking to people all day. I'm telling everyone to walk out of my clinic with a retinol time for me to start using one. Guess what I did? As doctors, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I used a retinol overnight and I walked around for about three weeks with a big irritant, a chemical burn basically from the retinol that I used. It went away. I'm perfect now. It took a few months, but I ended up getting a bit of a burn and that's not an unexpected result. One of the reasons this may happen is vehicle. Again, vehicle really, really matters. So a fast retinol release likely is behind greater skin irritation. A more elegant product that is better tolerated would deliver the retinol not as quickly, and you take into account the polarity of the product itself. Let's look at all of the clinical benefits of retinols. Now, retinols are, again, a lot of attention. When it comes to social media, we're at Lucere Skin, L-U-C-E-R-E-S-K-I-N. We do a lot of social media. We have a fairly good account for Canada, as far as Canada goes. <clears throat> it's so interesting to see how much focus there is on retinols. It is indeed all the rage. And it's nice to make recommendations when you know there's some data to back up the recommendations you make. So if you look at this curve, which is a superb summary of basically the biggest concerns that patients have, you have crow's feet and you have coarse under eye wrinkles. So guess what? Those are in fact some of the hardest things to correct 
even with neuromodulator or toxin injections, you're not going to get all those crow's feet gone or those coarse under eye wrinkles. But incredibly, over a period of two months, you can have up to 10% improvement of both of those parameters, a very hard to treat parameter, using the retinol that, I, that we're discussing. Then we look over a period of time, that's up to two months, where you're looking at fine lines and where you're looking at sallowness, you know, sallowness, the dullness, that lack of energy in, in, in skin. And you find a nearly 33% improvement in both parameters over a period of two months. So this is a double blind eight week study of 40 women, 40 to 69 years old, using the Rapid Wrinkle Repair Night Moisturizer. Very impressive results. Now let's look at other parameters over a long period of time. You have wrinkle parameters and you have pigmentation parameters. We know when it comes to retinols, there can be a benefit both not just in wrinkles, as we discussed in the last slide, but you can actually significantly improve pigmentation. Now there's learning things and reading things for the sake of just this cream, and then there's learning for the sake of understanding the actual world we live in in the cosmetic and aesthetic spheres. Please look at that. I love that Johnson & Johnson has put this together in a very um, organized fashion. So pigmentation, you have discrete pigmentation, you have modeled pigmentation, you have uneven skin tone, you have overall skin tone, and you have overall photo damage. This is actually basically a nice clinic on how to do uh, your approach to pigmentation in your aesthetic practice. Then you look at wrinkle parameters. You have forehead wrinkles, under eye wrinkles, crow's feet, uh, fine lines, crow's feet wrinkles, and cheek wrinkles. Again, this is a really nice way to approach just in your general consultation for your practice when it comes to aesthetics. Interestingly, the retinol compared to vehicle resulted in an improvement in every single parameter over the time of one year. And you find that you had 44% improvement in crow's feet fine lines and 84% improvement in modeled pigmentation. Just so you guys know, those are numbers that you aim for with a laser treatment. So patients who don't have much of a budget or patients who are already laser patients who want a better result, these numbers are absolutely fantastic. If I could deliver that every day consistently with a laser, I would buy that laser right away. So these are exceptionally good results. Over 50% of patients showed a greater than two grade improvement in several wrinkle and pigmentation parameters. So a really, really nice study to look at a lot of very important parameters. Our last uh, product line to discuss is acne. So we know acne is a concern for everyone. Um, and I've been fortunate uh, with the Canadian Dermatology Association with the uh, support of Johnson & Johnson, a major in initiative to look at modules to educate dermatologists on um, skin of color and dermatologic disease and skin of color. A great initiative, especially in light of the focus of, uh, of recent events, um, the attention that I think we should all have uh, to our uh, skin of color, and to understand that we have a rapidly changing population uh, that needs to be inclusive of, uh, of the needs of all. So we know acne is among the most common skin conditions. We know skin of color, especially black patients, can have acne that can have quite intense inflammation. And we know that one of the most troublesome features of acne in skin of color is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Scarring is the dreaded outcome that we all strive to treat our patients so they don't have that scarring at the end. Acne hyperpigmentation macules can be present in up to two thirds of blacks, over half of Hispanic patients, and nearly half of Asian patients with acne. So a substantially important uh, topic. Combination therapy, and I do love this product line for its simplicity. I love this product line for its very basic marketing, which is, red and white. This is an emergency for people who have acne and an important event. There's no greater emergency than getting rid of that acne as quickly as possible. And you have a simplicity in ingredients and you have an astoundingly good uh, profile as far as the results that patients are getting with this product. Let's talk about step one. You have what's called 
and labeled stubborn acne. Let's talk about step two, which is called stubborn marks. That's step one, stubborn acne. The active ingredient is 2.5% micronized benzoyl peroxide. And that step two is a retinol salicylic acid to help reduce post-acne marks. Now, what's interesting is the clinical validation of these products. And I was absolutely shocked to see the type of numbers that these products have produced. So when we look at um, treatment of the full face uh, and uh, treatment of active lesions, and then we also look at what happens when you treat post-acne marks and scars, you see that 100% had clear skin with their acne breakouts with the treatment of that first product, and 97% had improved complexion. So that's looking at uneven pigmentation and imperfection by the third month of treatment using the second product. So I'll just go back so you can have a look and kind of digest that. You have a really simple, literally one-two punch, stubborn acne, stubborn marks, simple ingredients, simple marketing, simple labeling, and you have clinical data to back it up. So again, this is quite an awesome thing to see. So I'll go ahead and we'll start polling question number two. Uh, what did you find the most compelling regarding this scientific presentation? Uh, please select one of the following. Was it the overall formulation of a product matters? Was it the nature of the dynamic skin barrier? Was it the comparative clinical research on retinol and hyaluronic acid? Or was it all of the above? Okay, I love the all of the aboves. That's fantastic. So I'm glad that you all found that um, all of these little facts and details were beneficial. Uh, I'm not surprised to see that as the answer. Um, I would agree. Uh, I think knowing uh, that there is so much uh, research is, uh, is a very pleasant surprise. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. And understanding the dynamic skin barrier, of course. So key takeaways for everyone. Uh, the skin barrier is a dynamic structure. It's a complex and incredible structure. Uh, it's the Ferrari of the human body, I think. It's very sophisticated. It has a lot of nuance and it has a lot of different qualities to appreciate. And it performs a lot of different functions for our overall skin health. Then we understand the value uh, of that knowledge of the dynamic nature of the skin barrier. And we also can appreciate that innovative skincare is absolutely uh, critical to nurturing our skin to better health. I am always appreciative of anyone, whether it's industry, whether it's uh, the labs at universities, it's the researchers who dedicate their lives and their efforts, uh, all in the name of helping us uh, become better at what we do so that we can provide to our patients and help our patients have a better outcome and better quality of life and uh, all the while making it a pleasant experience for the patients and an enjoyable experience for all of us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Zaki, for that very wonderful uh, lecture. I learned a lot, and I love that analogy of the Ferrari of the human body. Huh? <laughs> so we have actually a couple of questions. Uh, one is, can you comment on silicons in the product? Um, yeah, um, I actually uh, would say that uh, it's not a significant uh, aspect of any of the products, as far as I know, Dr. Kursik. Um, the, uh, in general, I am not afraid uh, of that ingredient in products. I think in dermatology, um, one of my, you know, interestingly, one of my favorite products, I don't know if you'd agree with this, Dr. Kursik, uh, is a is a close uh, mimicker is dimethicone. Uh, I am not afraid of uh, the value of these uh, products in skin. Uh, in fact, I think due to pressures from the public and the perceptions of even physicians, um, some good ingredients have not have been lost to us. Uh, I don't know if you remember Prevex, a very cool product that we used um, 
to help with skin barrier function. Um, I, I don't know if it's available in the States, but I know it disappeared to us here in Canada. But uh, yeah, I, it's, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a concerning agent to me at all. Uh, as far as I know, it's not a major uh, ingredient in any of our products. Well, actually, Dimeticon is part of grass, and we use it a lot in medical grade, uh, prescription grade um, vehicles. And it's a great occlusive moisturizer, which is non comedogenic. And that's Absolutely. the key there. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. The next mm -hmm. question is how do you think Bacuchiol compares to retinoids yeah. regarding efficacy? This is a super good question. So Bacuchiol has become such a trendy. Um, product more recently. Um, I think it's a very effective ingredient and the right formulation. Um, in my hands, I've had far far more experience and far better results, I think, with proper counseling and the best application of retinols. I think time will tell whether Bacuchiol is better. I, I wouldn't say it is right now, uh, but I'm, I'm intrigued. I think time will tell. And what's nice is, you know, you know, we have industry that's very interested in always getting the best of all ingredients. I mean, they they've patented olive oil and Mertis extracts. So I mean, yeah. why not find out about Bacuchiol next? Uh, but it is something that's very popular. It's a TikTok trend. It's an Instagram thing. Everyone loves it. Some very respectable skincare lines and physicians with their own personal skincare lines use it, and I love it. I respect it, but I don't yeah. know enough to compare. So I have a question for you, and it's a dilemma. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of patients with skin of color, almost more than 30% of my patient population is African-American. As you brought up the PIH, it's very important for them. Actually, the biggest complaint is not the pimples, it's the blemishes, right? Mm. And the other side of the coin is that, as you said, I think every patient should leave my office with some kind of a retinoid or mm. retinol. But I'm always afraid to treat my skin of color patients with a retinol or retinoic acid, which is gonna cause in the beginning a little bit of irritation, which may end up with more PIH. So how do you balance that act? It's always a balancing act that I'm struggling. Absolutely, and, and same with me, it's always a challenge. Um, I actually have a pre-printed handout that I give to everyone, and I'm a big fan of three things. One is when they first start using a retinol, they leave it, they apply it cold, so keep it in the fridge. It's kind of what we do with the non-steroidals like pimecolimus or tacrolimus. Uh, and then I say when you first start using it, maybe mix it one-to-one -one with your favorite moisturizer. When you first start using it, apply it for the first two weeks, 20 minutes at a time, then wash it off. Then for the next two weeks, put it on after dinner, wash it off before bed. And hey, if you graduate to overnight, you might get a better result. Um, on the other hand, a very good point, excellent point, Dr. Kursik, about the, the, the blemishes. It's, it's actually that pigmentation afterwards. There are some useful ingredients, right? Um, someone mentioned Bakucho, why not? There's vitamin Cs, there's niacinamide, there is tranexamic acid topically in some of these good formulations out there. There's kojic acid. So there's many different options that are non-hydroquinone that can potentially help fade. But I do think retinols are so foundational with such good long-term effects that you make you take that extra time, that little extra pain, or make it as easy as a handout. That's what I found to be a great trick. And just counsel them. If they get that counseling, they'll get there and they'll they'll reap the rewards. So the next question actually doesn't have anything to do with dermatology, but it's really an interesting one. And I think I sort of know the answer, but I'd like to know what you think. Could you please explain how transdermal products such as Voltrin or Emil Gel would be expected to cross this barrier to reach all the way to the arthritic joints? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, I wish, I'll tell you honestly, I'd rather hear from you because I don't have a great answer with, with that. I, I don't, don't think they do. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't have an answer. It's it's really it's really marvelous, and I, you know, it just my theories on it's all theories to me is there must be something about those nerves that sprout from those deeper areas, whatever is communicating. There must be some transmission of relief. It's just more of a relief thing. It's not curing anything, but there's a relief. Yeah. So it would be nice to see the PK studies and what's the level of the drug in the plasma, right? Yeah. That would tell us if they truly are um, they truly are penetrating the stratum corneum or not. 
which I, I really don't know, but I think it's a great point and it would incentivize for me to look at the studies to see if there are any PK studies. That Absolutely. would tell us if it's truly going there through the stratum corneum or not. I have no other way of knowing it. Absolutely. That's a great point. Very good. Very good question. So we are on the top of the hour. I really like to thank you so much. That was a very mm -hmm. eye-opening program. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley, can we go to the next slide? Maybe not. So, well, at this point, here we go. I thank you so much for our support again this evening, Johnson & Johnson, to make this program available to us. And uh, thank you, Dr. Tahir, again for joining us this evening and have a good evening to everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good night, everyone. Bye.